The reading from the Old Testament comes from the book of Ruth, beginning at the first chapter, the first 17 verses. Listen for God's word to us all. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Chilion also died, so that the women, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her, her, said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that you may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even I should, if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you will go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Let us pray. Well, God, may the words of my mouth and the reflections of our heart be acceptable in your sight this day and always. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The biblical story of Ruth is about family, what we do to survive and cope with difficult times, and how family is more than about biological bonds. We long for families that have the kind of loyalty and commitment to one another we see in this story, and we recognize that it's a rare gift. We think nostalgically about how families in generations past seemed more stable and more steady. And yet we understand that memory can often be aspirational and not just historical. In real life, the structure and form of families has gone through great change. Families today resemble the family of Naomi more than they do the family of a traditional husband and wife and two children. Family today is more like Ruth's family than Father Knows Best or even Family Guy. Here's how much family has changed. A California grandmother tells the story of her 11-year-old grandson who was spending a beautiful Sunday afternoon playing with video games. 
His older sister kept trying to coax him to come outside and play, and finally she gave him this warning. Someday you're going to be 30 years old, single, living with mom and playing video games all day. He paused for a second and he said, I can only dream. <laughs> the shape of today's family is diverse. Today's households include married couples with children, married couples with children in blended families, single parents with children, unmarried couples with children, unmarried couples without children, grandparents and parents living together with children, grandparents as primary caregivers of children, and as the 11-year-old boy imagined, parents with single young adults living at home. Children living with married parents, our traditional idea of the family, makes up only 34%, barely a little bit more than one-third of all American households. The Pew Research Center reports that there is no single family arrangement that encompasses the majority of children. We may remember a different time and wish it were true now, but the hard fact of contemporary family life suggests that we have to change the way we think about what makes family and how families are put together. The biblical story of Ruth gives us hints how to think differently about family. What sounds like a wonderfully inspiring story between two women who become BFFs is much deeper and much richer than that. It helps to understand the details of the story. Naomi was a woman from Bethlehem in Judah, a Hebrew woman easily relatable to other Jews at that time. What would have been difficult in the story is that the family ended up in Moab. A Hebrew family moving from Judah to Moab would be like a deeply rooted southern family moving up north. Added to that disconnect, any mention of the Moabites, Ruth's own clan, would have been met with disdain and disgust. Biblical history tells us that the Moabites were organized long ago in a taboo relationship. Subsequent history was both shameful and hostile. So bad was this history that the Moabites were declared in Deuteronomy under the law of Moses that Ten generations of Moabites would be prohibited from entering the assembly of the Lord. Hearers would have connected with the story of a family who had to move somewhere else just to survive. But they would have been scandalized to hear that Ruth and Naomi and her family had moved to Moab. Even more shocking would have been the reaction of Ruth to the subsequent events. Because Ruth had married into a family of foreigners and contrary to the mythology of popular humor, came to love and accept her mother-in-law as part of her true family. Even after her husband died and the conventional ties to Naomi were broken, she remained committed to her, willing to forsake her own family, her own family ties and bonds to honor the new bond she had with Naomi. The biblical scene of Ruth's refusal to abandon Naomi has become an immortal expression of the bonds of love that transcend family, clan, community, and even country. While sometimes misused in marriage ceremonies as a vow between a man and a woman, this expression of the commitment of one person to another is a model of relationships that help us redefine family. Family is not just blood relationship and kinship by marriage. Family is what happens when people are bound together by love that will not let each other go, no matter the cost or the risk. Throughout the Bible, the steadfast love seen in the story is most often understood to mirror the love that the Lord God has for God's people. Woven through the Old and New Testaments are stories of God using unlikely people to show us what God's love is like. This story of Ruth, the story of the Good Samaritan. These stories keep reminding us that when we are a part of God's family, we are never alone. And we're always a part of something bigger than ourselves and our circumstances. But with that comfort comes a challenge. 
If we stop with Ruth's story, we might leave with the notion that family is only who we love and who loves us. As true as that is, according to Jesus, it doesn't go far enough. In Mark's gospel, we heard a very troubling story. Shortly after Jesus had appointed the 12 apostles, Jesus apparently rejected his own biological family. Jesus' mother and brothers found him speaking to a crowd of people, and they sent word to him for him to join them. And some of the crowd passed their request on to Jesus. They said to Jesus, your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. But Jesus shocked the crowd and shocks us by saying, here are my brothers and sisters and mother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Is Jesus rejecting his biological family? It would seem so. But isn't family important in the Bible? Family is security, family is support, family is guidance. How can Jesus dismiss his family? He does it by redefining what family is. Family, according to Jesus, is not about biological kinship. It's about being a disciple and doing the will of God. This redefinition of family would not be so shocking if we remembered the story of Ruth. It wouldn't be such a surprise if we remembered Jesus' call to the apostles James and John who left their father and everything else and followed Jesus. It wouldn't be so startling if we remembered Jesus' challenge to put God at the center of our lives, replacing every other thing of value, and even, it seems, if that's family. Jesus is not reducing the definition of family. He's expanding it. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. I grew up in a Baptist family where it was normal to speak of other members in the church as, as Brother Jones or Sister Smith. And at a young age, I thought that was artificial and pretty hokey. See, I knew who my brothers and sisters were, and I just couldn't figure out why I would call somebody else brother and sister. I now know that such expressions are about more than blood relationships. They're about kingdom kin, connected by Christ, friends and partners and neighbors can become our brothers and sisters closer even than a biological family. If everyone does the will of God, if everyone who does the will of God is our family, then we have lots of brothers and sisters and relatives that we can name. You and I have brothers and sisters in Hungary today where church and nation are struggling with how to treat refugees and migrants. You and I have brothers and sisters in Syria where a beleaguered church tries to survive deadly suppression. And we have brothers and sisters in Israel and Palestine who search for ways through and beyond generations of conflict. You and I have brothers and sisters in Africa and in South America who as partners in ministry are trying to make their corner of God's kingdom a little bit better for everyone. We have brothers and sisters in Cuba who have kept the faith in difficult times and now seek to be faith in more challenging times. We have brothers and sisters in South Carolina who are emerging from devastating floods. We have brothers and sisters across this nation, even as we disagree on problems we face and possible political solutions. We have brothers and sisters in our community who come from different cultures and different traditions. And we have brothers and sisters, both literally and figuratively, who hold different values and different viewpoints from our own. Sadly, as you may know, blood and marriage kinship is not enough to keep families together. We all know families can be difficult and even damaging at times. But Jesus offers us hope for families in this world by expanding the notion of family to include all who do the will of God. 
our worth and value as individuals is not defined by who we are related to. Our worth is defined by who loves us. Biology is not destiny. Culture is not destiny. Discipleship is destiny. According to Jesus, we live as one family under God, brothers and sisters bound together by the love of God as Father. A love that will not let us go. We and all those who follow Jesus are family no matter where we live. And family sacrifices for family. Family cares for family. Family provides for family. Family nurtures family. Family forgives family. Family restores family. In God's kingdom, family is so much more than kin or clan or community, denomination or party or country. It's not who we are. It's whose we are. The God of Naomi and Ruth, the God of the Apostles, the God and Father of Jesus claims us as family. You are mine and I love you, says God the Father. Brother and sisters, welcome to the family. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the waters of baptism, you've been claimed by Christ and named as part of God's own family. So go out into the world in peace. Love and serve the Lord and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of that Holy Spirit be with each one of you on this day and all the days of your life.